Hi guys, I am back. I know it's been a while. I am super excited to bring to you today this interview. I actually recorded it late in the summer, but I had a pretty busy summer. I moved from the Raleigh area to the Chicago area. And I have just been working a lot in general, along with the move and moving. Oh my gosh, it just takes so much time. And of course, selling my house, buying a new house, all of the things. I've also been working on my programs a lot. I have a new completely free training. It's called Right Winning Wildlife Job Applications. And it is my best stuff when it comes to writing winning job applications. It's right there in the title. And so many people think they need more experience, more education. I have worked with several students now who we changed nothing but just their resume and their cover letter and they started getting interviews and jobs. So go to the website fancyscientist.com and check that out. If you are interested in a career in wildlife, you got to make sure that you stay tuned and, and listen to this episode because it is one of the best ones that I have ever done. And this is not to toot my own horn. <laughs> this is mostly because of Scott Putnam. He is a regional fisheries biologist with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, and he is just so excited about his career. He's so into it, and he's been going at it now for about three decades, and he is also really passionate about helping people who are interested in going into this career as well. I was put in touch with Scott through Ron Lewis. If you haven't listened to that podcast, his podcast is all about starting a wildlife uh, career with no wildlife experience and then also at the age of 49. And Scott Putnam is his boss. And Ron spoke so highly of Scott and he was like, you know what? He probably would want to come on your podcast too. Should I invite him? And I was like, yes, absolutely. So that's exactly what happened. So we talk a lot about careers, especially with the government focusing on the state government. Now this is about fisheries research, but it applies to a lot of terrestrial animal work as well. Scott works with endangered species. So there is lots of great advice in here. I want to make sure that you listen to it. This is such a great episode. So I will stop blabbering on and let's get into it. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm so excited to have you here and to talk about wildlife jobs. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm glad to be here. Before we begin, or just I guess as my first question, why don't you just take uh, a few minutes and tell us about what you do, where you work, and what it's like? Okay. Well, I work for Idaho Department of Fish and Game. I'm based out of Lewiston, Idaho. I've been working for Idaho Fish and Game for 30 years this month. So it's been a wow. while. I, uh, I, I work mainly on anadromous fish, meaning uh, steelhead trout and Chinook salmon. Monitor those both in fresh water and in their migration to and from salt water. But historically, I've, I've, I've run the gamut. I started out as a volunteer. I was a volunteer for Fish and Game, bridging two careers at that point, but getting my foot in the door with Fish and Game. Then I started out on the bottom as a, a bio aid, which is entry level position in fisheries, and then worked up into a more permanent position with Fish and Game, and still in the anadromous fish world. And uh, at one point, I took a side trip of, uh, I was an enforcement officer, I was a conservation officer, so I have that aspect or that perspective also. Uh, education wise, I started out as a wildlife man major, but here in Pacific Northwest, it take, take me long to realize that the, the jobs and the money were in the anadromous fish world, mainly because of the endangered species issues. Mm -hmm. So many of the fish that I work with are listed as threatened and or endangered. So uh, pretty solid funding source. So keeps my crews going and we just keep uh, generating 
data to help everybody make those critical management decisions. And did you always know you wanted to go into wildlife? Like, how did you, how did you make that realization to go into this uh, career? Yeah, a life, you know, my whole life. I, I grew up in the outdoors, had a, a family that was very supportive and always in the outdoors. It was, it was just a natural way for me to go. I took a, right out of high school, I took this, a side route of actually got into business administration and did that for several years. But still, what was really tugging at me was to get into uh, wildlife fisheries management. So just uh, made that life choice, life change at uh, 35 years old. Wow. Why did you do business administration? It, it was a very lucrative job. It, it, yeah. was a, it was a good opportunity that I have. Interesting. It started out in that job. It, I was uh, working on research and development in an agriculture and uh, uh, working on how to grow some, uh, something as simple as lettuce on, on sand, beach sand in South mm -hmm. Florida. So I had developed techniques and equipment and really got me started in the research and development aspects, which, you know, that's what I do now every day is more research and development. And mm -hmm. so it's a natural progression into that. What kind of research do you do then? Is it mostly like monitoring type of work? A lot of it's monitoring. I have three main projects. One is fish trapping. What I'm doing is I've got the largest and the second largest fish trap on the Snake River and Salmon River in the Pacific Northwest. And my goal is to capture juvenile salmon and steelhead as they're out migrating to the ocean and put computer chips in them, pit tags. Oh, cool. And my goal is to put in about 35,000 pit tags in a three month period. So we can Whoa. track. Them. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. No small operation. That's what you, you had a person on here a while ago, <laughs> Ron, that's what Ron does. He's, he is at the, at my salmon river trap and he's busy putting uh, computer chips and fish and we'll track those as they out migrate. And with that data, we can, we know where they're at so we can make adjustments to the hydro system to get flow or, or so, some of them are actually putting barges and barged around the dams. And those decisions are based on the computer chips that we're putting in here. This is the largest uh, tagging operation, river tagging operation, by the way. And then from there, I, I do that starting in March and I do that to the end of May. And then I change hats literally over a weekend to running field crews, uh, snorkel crews, snorkel surveys. And I have this map in, behind me, and basically what you're looking at is my office. That is my office. I don't normally spend time here behind a mic and in front of a camera, but I'm usually out in the field there. And that is basically all the places that salmon and steelhead go in Idaho. And so mm -hmm. I have crews right now, as we speak, out in those crevices and nooks and crannies of that map, wilderness areas being Frank Church Wilderness, the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness, uh, other places like that, actually snorkeling up streams, counting juvenile fish right now. They're out for eight days at a time, have six days off. And I usually find on their six days off, they love where they where I send them for work. They actually go back on their days off. So they're out there counting fish right now. And then that will go into the end of August. In fact, I, I do that by design. That, that job is designed that starts once the college students are out and it, it ends the third week of August so that college students can go back. Right now we've got 35 folks involved in this right now across the state. Wow. And uh, so, yeah, they're out counting fish and they'll do that into August. Then after that, I switch gears into actually surveying adult spawning Chinook salmon. So I'll be back up in those remote areas again uh, yeah, it's a tough job. I'll spend in the fall walking mountain streams, counting spawning Chinook salmon, wild spawning Chinook salmon at that. So, cool. so you get out to the field a lot then? I do by design. I, I, am, I am one of the rare ones in this uh, career path as far as my uh, position being a, a regional fisheries biologist. Most are are spend a lot of their time in the office administration wise and whatnot, but I've always insisted that I have a, at least an equal showing in the field with my crews and uh, it's very important to me. So yeah, I'm very fortunate. 
That's great. Yeah. That's one of the things that I noticed after getting my PhD, when you're, when you're going through grad school and, and you watch graduate students, like talk about their research on social media and stuff, it's all very active and in the field. But then once you graduate, I noticed the jobs are behind the desk mostly. And you're, and if you're a professor, you're sending students out to the field and they're the ones who are, who are collecting data. And I mean, across, you know, nonprofits, government too, like you're the one managing people. So was that hard for you to design it that way? Like, did you receive any like pushback or anything or? No, no, the department's been very supportive. I was actually reluctant to make that jump into regional fisheries biologist for that reason. I liked my, my previous title was a senior fishery technician. And that was, you know, crew leader, not at the administration end per se, but it turned out that I was able to get, get things lined up to where with this position, I was able to spend a big part of it. And that basically was a, the trigger I needed to make that leap and, and the acceptance of the offer to take that position. And, and it is, you're exactly right. At, at a regional fisheries biologist position, and not just fishing game, but I think is speaking for many other agencies, it is more of an administration. Thus, you know, little career tips for your students is take those business classes because when you get to my level, yeah, you're going to spend a lot of time balancing budgets, personnel issues, things like that. And you're going, well, but what about the fish? Well, that's why you normally hire crews for at this point. So uh, yeah, those other uh, side trips and uh, the business world and whatnot can be very beneficial. So, so yeah, I saw that you gave me a, um, like a couple of pages for, for those of you guys who don't know, a couple of pages of some of the tips that you provide. And that was one of them. And I wanted to ask you about that. So as an employer, if you saw students have business classes on their resume, that's something that you, you would like. Definitely. Yeah. Especially for higher, you know, if they're looking at advancement, they want to become a biologist or they even want to go farther staff biologist or get into more of the administration of fish and wildlife, that business education will help you a lot, especially if, you know, you never think about this. You start out working as a culturist in a fish hatchery, and then one day you become the director of fish and game, you go, mm -hmm. well, it'd be nice to have had a, a, uh, a business class, because now that's what you're dealing with is more budgets and dealing with the legislature, dealing with the politics, things like that. And that business uh, experience is, is valuable or education is valuable. Yeah, that's good advice. Well, if I'm ever in your area, I love swimming. So I'm definitely going to take you up on us or I'm going to ask you if I can join in on a snorkel crew. That I'll, sounds like always, so much fun. Always welcome. And I invite people that want to come along as volunteers. We, we have a very good program in fish and game. We'll get you signed up as a volunteer to cover all the legalities there, but uh, we'll get you out there and getting you in the field for a hitch. And like I said, we're, we're out for eight days at a time. And so it's, it's pretty, pretty good life. I always tell the folks that work for me, you know, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, you know, there'll be a day that there'll be a biologist someday and they will be sitting in front of a computer in December, working on a budget or writing an annual report, which I always call paying the bills, right? So those reports that pay the bills. So you'll be looking out the window, window thinking about, wow, I sure wish I was back on the snorkel crew. You know, the, the crazy thing is it's the lowest paid position in fish and game. As far as I'm concerned, it's, it's the best, most rewarding position because you are out in the field all the time and it can be tough work. No two ways about it, but it, it sure is a lot of fun. Do you find the world of fisheries and terrestrial species to be pretty divided? Because when I was in graduate school, I was actually part of the biology department, but um, I worked really closely with the fisheries and wildlife students and took some classes there. But it seemed like they were really separate, even though they were in the, the same building. So if somebody starts off in terrestrial species, can they switch to, to fish and vice versa, or is it pretty different? I, I would say that, that the skills are interchangeable. I see that even within our agency. Basically, the wildlife folks are in the second floor of our building. The fishery folks are on the, the base floor of the, of the building. And, you know, a lot of the colleges around here, they have the fish or wildlife. 
Although the University of Idaho's credit, which is 33 miles from here, and I do a lot of work with the University of Idaho, they do a lot of integrating of the programs and interdisciplinary training. And, and I think that's real beneficial. But I, like I said, I started out for fish and game with a wildlife management degree with a minor in criminal law. <laughs> and then I got into fish and game, but I realized that while I was going to school that the jobs were in fishery. So I thought I'll have the experience in fishery. So I worked on seasonal crews, but I'll have the education in wildlife. Well, once I graduated, uh, the fisheries folks said, no, we're keeping you. We want, want you to stay with us. And I did, I, I don't look back. I have a lot of folks that do work for me that are, you know, by according to their transcripts, they're, they're destined for wildlife jobs. But I could speak for our agency anyways, that most of our jobs in the wildlife aspect, whether it's wildlife management, wildlife biologist, or even our enforcement crews, uh, our officers are mainly paid by license money. In Idaho, we get no general fund money. Everything is directly off from licenses. And so as the economy goes up and down, you know, now we're talking possible recessions, which, you know, it turns out at the end of the day, hunting and fishing can be expendable. And so, you know, we're a little nervous there how that's going to impact that. But our wildlife folks and our enforcement folks can suffer sometimes just because of the economy. Whereas my projects are actually mandated uh, as mitigation. And so I'm able to keep going mainly because uh, what's driving our programs are the Endangered Species Act. I, I have a lot, a lot of stability in that for the project. This project that I'm running, the Smoke Mine Project, started in 1983. Wow! So it's it's been around a long time, and as long as the dams, the hydro system is in, we will continue to monitor it. In fact, during the 2020 COVID uh, outbreak uh, or epidemic, I actually received a call saying that of all operations, my two fish traps, one of which Ron works on now. It uh, was deemed essential. The federal monitoring at the, the main stem dam facilities were shut down by COVID, but yet they recognize that my two traps were so significant. They said, if at all possible, if you could put together a program, keep going, please do. And we did. I, I wrote pretty stringent guidelines for my operations. We, we uh, socially distanced uh, uh, and everything went off well. And we, at the end of the day, even the federal reports on what happened to the migrating fish that year was all based on my two traps. So, so it was nice having that, that little bit of security. Is poaching of the fish an issue in your area? A little bit, you know, not, not so much as poaching of big game apple animals, but we do uh, occasionally have somebody that will, you know, take too many fish, uh, whether it's Chinook or just resident rainbow trout or cutthroat. But uh, we, we actually see more poaching on the wildlife side mm -hmm. than what we do on the fishery side. Can you briefly talk about what you do as a, as a conservation law officer? I don't yep. think I've really talked to anyone in that field at all. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm no longer a conservation officer. Mm -hmm. I did that years ago. Uh, but I can speak to it. I know it very well. Uh, so in Idaho, uh, a conservation officer is actually a certified peace officer. So what that means is I had to go to police academy. And in my class of 43, I was in class with state police, county sheriffs, deputies, city police and such. And in Idaho, you are deputized as a state officer. And why that's, that's significant is if you look at that map behind me, there's a whole lot of area in between the few towns that are there. And, and a lot of times the only law enforcement presence in our remote, remote communities is our fish and game officers. Mm -hmm. So they may be called on to, to assist with uh, a DUI or speeding or domestic, mm -hmm. you never know. Those are rare though, you know, don't get me wrong. That, those, those things happen so, so rarely. Your, your main job is to go out and work on fish and game violations and what. 
But in Idaho, in Idaho, also the conservation officer is that for for much of the department, it is the face between the the agency and the public. And so what they do a lot of is hunter education, free fishing day, uh, working with the Boy Scouts, 4-H groups, things like this, a lot of information and education. And so that's a big part of the job. And that was a big draw for me why I got involved in the conservation officer aspect of it is I really enjoyed going out, working with the general public, the education aspect. But, but again, I could, uh, you know, get in the truck and turn on the blue light. And I didn't have an issue with that either. So you've been in this field now, you said for three decades, can right. you talk about how it's changed from a, a job perspective? Yeah, I, I, so I, I just came from a meeting at our headquarters uh, last week. And one of the things that we're really proud of and really pr promoting and is re very applicable to this group is uh, Fish and Game looking at the uh, you know, last few years is, if I was to summarize it in one statement, that is we've become more, more inclusive. And, and specifically is the number of females that have become biologists and what, for example, there are four regional fisheries biologists doing similar work to what I'm doing. And the other three have only been, two of them are less than uh, a month old in their positions. One's, the, the, the third one has been in for about a year. And, uh, but yes, they are, they are replacing men that have been doing these jobs for years. And we're seeing that across the department. We're seeing a lot more participation and interest and, and we're, we're excited about it. It's great stuff. We're seeing a lot more involvement there. And uh, so I think that's a, a big change. And like I said, that was acknowledged at our state meeting last week. That's great. Yeah, I notice in grad school <laughs> and in undergrad too, that the classes seem to be 50-50. Like there doesn't seem to be a, a skew anymore and even heavily more heavily female sometimes right um, but yeah it, it, it's still at the top a lot of those jobs are still men so it's it's like you said it's probably just going to take some time to for the turnover to happen and for us to take over the world no, that's joking. right, that's right. <laughs> well you're doing a mighty fine job of it so. <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> what about um like in terms of education or, or experience or preparation for this field? Can you talk about like how things have changed? It seems like there's a lot more competition now. A lot more competition. And, you know, one thing I, I, I talk about a lot is, you know, a lot of the positions I have, you know, my snorkel crew, that's an entry level position. We, we first day we teach how to spell fish, let alone how to identify them, you know, you come in and, and I, I spend eight days training you on everything from how to identify our fish out here to the snorkel techniques, to swift water rescue training and other aspects. But, uh, you know, in reality, you don't need a college education for that. I could teach anyone that's willing to learn. But what you find, and then with my trapping, you need a little more experience in fisheries, mainly because you are working and handling and pit tagging, once I get you up to speed, uh, listed fish, salmon mm -hmm. and steelhead. So that, that's critical. And you know, at that point, I do like a little more experience. But that being said, most positions in fishing game, you could come in as with no college education. We, we do like to see some college education, mainly if nothing else, it shows your interest and your devotion to this line of work that maybe you'll stick around a while. But what we really see, especially when I start hiring for my technicians, my senior techs, positions like that, is you don't need to have a master's degree, but at the end of the day, I get a lot of applicants who are, who are have master's degrees or just wrapping up and are applying for their first per permanent or seasonal job. And, and when it comes down to it, if I have a master's degree versus no degree or, or some education, uh, a lot of, lot of employers in, even within Fish and Game will lean towards that master's degree. Mm -hmm. I am anymore at this point, I am the old guy in fisheries right now. So yeah, I, I tell people I pretty well got that aspect figured out and, and, 
And what I've been working on the last few years of this, your podcast is part of my, my, my progression is uh, doing a lot more mentoring. I do a lot of mentoring. And so I hire a lot of folks that are just cutting their teeth on this, just trying to get their feet in the door. And so I've been leaning more towards giving people that opportunity and realizing I have a lot more, uh, I put more resources as far as training and what, but, but I'm up for that. That's been fun. That's been a fun part of my job. What kind of tips do you have for people trying to get their first permanent position? That seems to be like the, the roadblock, like they'll get seasonal positions, but I, I also hear a lot of people talk about how it's difficult to find permanent entry level positions. Per- permanent are tough. Even within our agency, they're tough. I've seen a lot of really good people just beat their head against the wall for four or five years in seasonal positions and then move on to other department, other agencies or on with the feds and whatnot to get in. Because bottom line is, yeah, I've, I've been here 30 years. I, every year I stay is you know, one less opportunity for someone going for a permanent position, right? And so we we just had this big turnover even in fish and game, but it was kind of the, the baby boomer rush, you know, a lot of the old timers are, are retiring right now. And so that's why now we're seeing a lot of new faces in, in, the, in the field as far as biologists, but also in the enforcement end. Our, our enforcement folks in our region right now, uh, you know, we got almost 20 of them right here and probably three quarters of them probably have less than five years experience. So mm-hmm. it, it's really, you know, once, once we uh, have an opening, the competition's pretty high and it's not uncommon to have a hundred to 200 applicants for that one. So as far as advice, one thing to think about is what sets you apart. Uh, you know, when we put these job announcements out, we're really giving you a test. We put in the job description what the job entails. During correspondence interviews, things like that, or I always suggest, you know, really lean heavy on that. We're going to ask you questions, but again, we're geared towards what we're giving you, the answers in that job announcement. The other thing is, give us a call. When you see we got a job, when I, I post my, my jobs, uh, my name's attached to it. My phone number's on it. My email's on it. Give me a call. Ask for more information. Uh, get the details so that when we do go through the interview process, you not only know what I'm looking for, but if you can give me back some feedback on some homework you've done, you've looked at some of the websites that I'm providing data to and, and ask some intelligent questions about some of our work, uh, that, that, that gets, gets our attention. I, I always tell this story. I had one gentleman years ago, I was giving a talk for a bunch of college students and this gentleman came up to me afterwards and he handed me his business card. It had his name on it, had his number on it and his job title was fishery student. Mm-hmm. And I thought, and he, he was still in school. He was still, a, he was a sophomore or a senior at that point. And I thought, wow, this is thinking outside of a box. You know, and when you're, you're working on a, 100 foot long fish trap in the middle of the snake river at high flow and you've got a lot going on you have to think outside of the box a lot and i thought well this this gentleman did that i ended up hiring him offering his first seasonal position he was one of them also that couldn't quite break the ice into a permanent just because we didn't have the opera the permanent opportunities at that time so he went on to a another agency works here locally and he's been with them for five six years now and he's doing a great job i get to work with them during red surveys every fall but uh, again you know for him it was something as simple as that little business card something that that set him apart from the -the run-of-the-mill applicant because as i always say a lot of these entry-level positions uh you know almost any fishery student or wildlife student or even for that matter anyone can apply for it because most have, I guarantee it's from the fish trap. No one's ever worked on fish traps like this unless they've worked for me. When, mm-hmm. when you have the only, only operation that, that, that's a pretty exclusive crew. So I don't really look at experience. And so a big part of that is, is chemistry 
you know, my my field crews right now, snorkel crews, I've I've got five people in the field here locally right now today that, uh, you know, they're out for eight days at a time and they don't come back to civilization, civilization. They leave on Wednesday. They don't see civilization until the following Wednesday. And at the end of the day, you know, I could teach them the, the fisheries knowledge of what they need to do, collect the good data. But what I can't teach them is how to have those interpersonal skills that they don't want to kill each other by day seven after being in, you know, 100 degree weather with biting mosquitoes and swimming in 42 degree water for 10 hour days and having to eat over a campfire at night and look at a whole lot of windshield time because some, some of our sites take eight hours to drive to. We have to go from Lewiston here to Montana to come into the back door of Idaho. So <laughs> there's a lot of windshield time, but just getting the chemistry of the personalities, that's a big part. And, and which leads back to your original question is get to know the fish and game folks, get to know me. We have volunteer opportunities. We have public meetings all that time, all the time. Show up at them, come up, introduce yourself, tell us where you're at. Uh, if, if you're interested in hearing my two cents worth on career class ideas, uh, you know, ask for that type of stuff. But again, set yourself out above the rest of the crowd. Mm -hmm. I liked your advice about calling and it can, so you're saying it can be just simple as, as calling when you're thinking about applying for a job or where you're going to apply for a job and just asking, like, can you tell me more about the job? That's all somebody has to say. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly it, Stephanie. And, uh, yeah, you know, we're fairly vague on our, on our job announcements. And, and if you call and say, get more information, first of all, you know, really see if this job is right for you. I have a, I, while I work on anadromous fish, I have a, a, a colleague here in the office who works on resident fish. So he, he works on uh, the bluegills, the crappies, the bass. He works on the, the, the rainbow trout we stock in the local ponds, things like that. And Robert's very active with me on recruiting. And that's, he's really anymore. He's, he, he says it's, it's almost a necessity that folks need to contact us, get more information to be competitive. Again, anybody can just spew back, even if they just look at our job announcement, but to get the real nuts and bolts of what the project is. Yeah. Give us a call. We welcome that. And, um, is it appropriate, like I, like some of my students and even, even me, like have a hard time understanding if I'm competitive for a job or not, is it appropriate for them to ask you, like, you know, I'm thinking about applying for this job. Um, do you think I'm a, a good competitor or a good you candidate bet. for it? You bet. Okay. I welcome that. In fact, take it a step further. One thing, and, and again, I can't speak for others as far as agencies, I can speak for ours and I can speak for me specifically. And, uh, yeah, if you see my jobs and, and let's say you're, you know, mostly for my snorkeling crews, it's generally freshmen, sophomores that are applying for that. When you get to the fish trap level, it's usually graduates, mainly because I'm working during the school season is when, when that comes in. But if you're interested in that type of stuff, or if you're looking at, you know, regional fish biologists like my position, or you're looking at staff biologists or whatnot, it, it would not be a wrong to actually call and say, hey, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sophomore now or I'm a junior. Maybe I'm a senior getting ready to graduate next year. I know I'm not going to be available for your position for this go around. But do you mind if I go through the interview process to learn what you might ask and what you might need for that position so that in a year now when I actually am available, and I will not only be competitive, but I'll I'll be able to fill in any gaps in the next year to better suit this position. That that would be golden if someone wanted to do that. Wow. So, so, yeah. so, so you wouldn't think that as like them wasting your time? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I I I hope I dazzle you so well in that year that you'll <laughs> want to just fight to come to a job. So here's the deal. I had I had a you know, right before COVID hit, I'd just given a talk at the University of Idaho and I had those students just fired up. They're ready to go. You between the videos I showed, the gee whiz cool stuff we do and what. And I ended up going through the hiring project process. And I, I am one that 
no matter if I have a hundred applicants, I will call 100 that didn't get the position to talk to them and to fill in the gaps, help them. What can I do next time to, to improve? And it's amazing that the word is out there. I didn't know I had this now, but I, the word is out there. They're all asking me, can I go on the waiting list for your job? So I guess there's a late waiting list to get on my, but there isn't. But I, I was, I, I took that as a positive positive yeah. thing right? people who want to be on waiting lists to get on our jobs and go out there and fight mosquitoes and swim in 42 degree water and hike in five mil black neoprene wetsuits at 120 degrees outside so yeah i don't i don't know <laughs> wow that's so, so great of you to give them that feedback it's yeah. it's really rare for people to hear yeah. anything other than we went with somebody else yeah. Well, um, those are most of my questions. So uh, do you have like one last thing we didn't cover that you'd like to um, offer to our podcast audience? And then we can open up to student questions after afterward. Yeah, I just say get out there and volunteer, get to, mm -hmm. you know, start making contact with those agencies or folks involved in it. I am involved with American Fishery Society, which is a national group, you know, and, and so I, I deal with people outside of just Idaho fishing game, uh, other agencies. And I, you know, the, the attitude of many agencies are the same. I was also involved with uh, the wildlife society when I was a, a mm -hmm. wildlife I was actually on executive committee for that. So uh, I could say that the wildlife side of the coin is, is just as receptive and especially so in Idaho fishing game. So reach out, volunteer, you know, get involved, learn more about the jobs, ask questions. And, and uh, we, we take mentoring very seriously. If someone calls me up and asks for me, ask me for assistance, I'm always there. I always tell people that my favorite time of the year is Christmas. I've been doing this a long time. I've had literally hundreds and hundreds of people that have worked for me over the years. And I always look forward to that time of year because a lot of folks recognize that December is when they first applied for their first job for me. And now they're biologists. Now they're, you know, bureau chiefs and major, you know, uh, agencies, departments making big decisions and whatnot. And they realize that they really started in December. And I will invariably get those emails of thanks every year. And I really look forward to that. Yeah, so I always tell people when they work for me, go do well. The other thing is when you get in with us, you know, there's always a possibility. Uh, Idaho Fishing Game does sponsor graduate projects. So we, we have to have, you know, we got research going on. We don't have time to do it, but a, a graduate student would be great. So we work with uh, universities and, and help pay their bills and whatnot. And I tell folks, go do well. You know, go get your master's degree, whatever, and come back and be my boss someday. So mm -hmm. I always encourage that. Well, thank you so much. You gave us so many great tips. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this and help so many people. Thank you once again, Scott, for that amazing interview. I really can't thank you enough for giving such great free advice to people, to the listeners of this audience. Scott is super nice and he is super welcoming of questions. So I am actually going to give you his email address. This is usually something I do not do with guests, but it is Scott, S-C-O-T-T -T dot Putnam, P-U-T-N-A-M at I-D, I-D-F-G dot Idaho dot gov. That's sorry, I-D-F-G dot Idaho dot gov. And it is also in the show notes, so go ahead and click over to the, the website show notes and you'll be able to find the email address there. Scott also has a really cool YouTube channel. He's passionate about making videos and, and photography, and he has even screened his videos at the University of Idaho Fish and Wildlife Film Festival. Festival. So if you want to check out those videos, as some of them have to do with the endangered species he talked about in this episode, then head over again once to the show notes. I hope you have an amazing day and be